So, um, Yvonne Ng is um, going to chair a panel on specifications and standardization. And I'll leave oh, Yvonne introduce slides. the participants. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, if we can get Lars, uh, Jerome, and Martin up on the, on the stage. Um, so we're going to continue our talk on specifications and standardization um, with this panel. And um, I want to first just uh, let you know, this is outside of the day-to-day the -day work I usually do as an archivist, so it's um, really interesting for me to be here. And so we're going to hear from um, three panelists to, uh, who have been involved um, not only in standardization work, but in writing specifications, interpreting, and building tools based on standards and specifications. Do you all want to have a seat on the, at the table? Um, so um, let me um, introduce our three uh, panelists first. Um, we have Jerome Martinez, um, who's the founder and president of Media Area. He's the lead developer of Media Info and a technical consultant on a variety of projects um, within the fields of broadcast video, audiovisual archiving, and web video. Um, his work specializes in the analysis and categorization of AV data, as well as quality control, AV metadata, and the development of, of open source solutions for media communities. Um, we also have Lars Gaustad. Um, he works with film, audio, video, and digital preservation at the National Library of Norway. He's been there since 1992, and he's currently in charge of moving image preservation there. He was the chair of standards of the T standards subcommittee on archiving and restoration of the Audio Engineering Society until it was uh, the committee was dismissed several, several years ago. And he was the chair of the technical committee of YASA for 15 years and has al also been involved with the ISO. And finally, um, Martin Bello is a developer and specification author working on the Metroska specification. Um, so I'm going to start with an individual uh, question for each speaker, um, to which uh, the other panelists can respond. And then I have general questions for the entire panel, um, but I'd also like to open it up to audience questions, uh, both our on-site and, and online audience, um, and also open it up for panelists to ask questions to the other panelists. So um, I thought maybe I'd start first with you, Martin. Um, so uh, we heard from uh, Steve about the current state of Matroska, and Ashley spoke about the process of writing specs and how they've been trying to open the process of um, spec writing um, on Matroska. So as a specifications writer um, yourself working on Matroska, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your experience. Um, what has been going well? What are some of the major challenges that you see in this process? Um, what are some things that you might, you've, you've learned that you can share with the audience? Okay. <coughs> uh, first, I'm, I'm a very small light, yes. Uh, he's, a, he's a great man, and there I am. <laughs> and um, I'm very new to uh, Matroska development, uh, especially specifications. Uh, Dave has many uh, helped me, and Steve, and Moritz Bunkus, and uh, yeah, I'm a noob. But it's a, it's a very, very interesting work. Um, it's a little bit complicated in, in the front, but uh, after a little bit help, you, you, you see it's very easy to help. And uh, everything what you can do, it's, it's necessary for the specification development. Um, first, uh, you should uh, sign up on GitHub. That's the first point to... Uh, to help to improve the, the specs, and yeah, for me it's uh, it's very complicated because uh, I'm very new to this and hmm, I cannot say much about this for, for the first time. Um, what what have been some of the challenges, or what what things have in this process have have you found really um, helpful? Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, have you come upon any challenges as, as you've been? Uh, Coming to this as a, as a new as a new person, or um, what what has been particularly helpful in this process? Oh God, <laughs> hmm. I don't know really. Um, helpful, yeah. Hmm. Sorry, I, did, I don't know. Um, is anybody here help me to translate this to to German? <laughs> ah, okay. 
uh, very rare. <sighs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, okay. Sorry if I wasn't clear. Helpful was the meeting last year. That was very, very helpful. I met Steve and we could uh, talk about a little bit about uh, the specs and especially the codex, uh, Matroska menu codex. I am very interested in the uh, improvement the Matroska menu and um, yeah. You should, uh, you should contact Moritz Bunku. It's the very, very best person I have met ever in the internet. <laughs> very friendly, competent, and 99.9% uh, answer, answered all of the questions, also perfect. And uh, yeah, what is helpful? Dave is very, very helpful. Um, and uh, GitHub, I have no ideas on GitHub, but uh, you can help, you get help from Dave and others, and uh, what was helpful too. Um, yeah, the old specs are very helpful, I think. The new specs, maybe, maybe too. <laughs> we will see. And uh, the community on Doom 9, Doom 9, is a very, very good start, a place to start with uh, the first experiences in uh, Matroska. For me, was the first place. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Good. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to move on to the introductory questions for our, our other two panelists. Um, so next um, to Lars. Um, so you've done a lot of standardization work as well as work on recommended practices coming out of of standards. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the process of going from developing standards to implement implementation and adoption to best practices and the role that you've um, played in that process. Um, and if you can comment on any, any aspects of standards that have made implementation or adoption more or less challenging. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, now it's working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, standards are often incomprehensible to the community that they're actually addressing. And, and I think that was one of the main reasons for us to, to start uh, writing recommendations when, when we started uh, writing the recommendations within the technical committee of, of, the, of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives. Uh, I mean, we may not daily realize this, but, but audiovisual archiving is in, in, in a historical uh, uh, aspect relatively newborn. There wasn't in the 80s very much on audiovisual archiving. And, and during the 90s and, and, and early 2000, people started to put out uh, recommendations and documents on how to actually do this work. So, so um, we, we lo sort of looked at standards and, and trying to make them uh, understandable. And, and to a certain degree, I think that the, the document on digitization and preservation of digital audio is, is a comprehensive uh, uh, document, uh, which points to a lot of standards that existed. And, and uh, and I have to say that going back to, to the document now, um, some of the standards, first of all, you need to put up 500 euros to get the standards. Mm -hmm. And then the standards shows to, to physical objects that you need to use that's no longer available, not even on eBay. So we sort of have to constantly go back to the, to the documents and, and rewrite them <laughs> to make them usable for, for the community today uh, in terms of, um, I mean, if you point to a certain test disk that was available 30 years ago for, for the, for the uh, record pressing industry uh, and the record is no longer available, you have to sort of point to other ways. You can define rumble in your, in your uh, vinyl playback system. So, so, yeah, 
so it's 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 all about uh, getting together and 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 uh, and um, sort of uh, extract the best knowledge from each head in in your community mm -hmm. and, uh, and and putting that into paper great and um a question for jerome now um so with your work with Media Info, um, you've had to deal with a lot of issues um, uh, when working with and interpreting standards that may or may not be well defined. Um, so, can you tell us a bit about some of these issues you faced and how you've dealt with them? There are different cases. Um, with Media Info, we analyze a lot of different formats, so we have to deal with different um, uh, standards from different organizations, ISO, SMPT, and so on. Um, the first difficulty is to have the standards because uh, there are a lot of paywall, and if you are not rich enough, uh, that does not work. So you, you, need, uh, uh, you need to have some money. Hopefully, sometimes it is elsewhere on the internet. It is good. Um, and with, uh, but when we you get the standards, sometimes uh, it is not precise enough. Um, I remind about uh, um, some uh, AFD uh, thing in MXF in the first versions. It was not so good defined, and after that, uh, um, entities, the developers, they implemented something in different ways. So if we want to test the um, the file against a, a specific standard. Uh, and the standard is not good enough, uh, we are blocked. We cannot say it is good or not good because the standard is not good itself. It is a, a, a problem on that side. And on the other side, we, uh, we have some uh, two, uh, uh, files uh, and formats which are in use a lot, like Matroska and FFV1, but there is a lack of official standards. So in that case, um, we, if we want to, to say if a file is valid or not, we, we have to check the draft of uh, standards. So sometimes there is, uh, for Matroska, there was some documentation, but not a standard. And for FFV1, there was also a draft. And in that case, uh, this draft was not enough, and we wanted a standard. This is the reason we applied to, uh, with IETF in order to have some, uh, a standard with this format. And um, in that case, we the issue is that we have already files, and the standard comes after the files. And um, w um, we are facing two different cases. So files are there, and if we decide to change uh, in order to be uh, to be a standard, in order to comply to standards proce process, in order to to be better, in order to uh, to have something coherent. We, um, we break a lot of files and in, uh, it is not acceptable. So for FFV1 and Matroska, the process is not exactly like for uh, over H264, uh, for example, or because the standard is done before the encoder. Uh, in the case of Matroska and FFV1, we need to, to check what is the most used in the files and what is the most used uh, feature, um, how it is implemented the most, and we, d we have to decide what we put in the standard in that case. Um, another case is, for example, for FFV1, um, in some cases the, the draft was, uh, was there, so saying <coughs> something. We implemented the uh, decoder in Media Info in order to validate uh, the streams, and it was weird. We um, the code in Media Info, we, we, we thought that it is okay compared to the draft of the standard, but we didn't, uh, we were not able to, to validate the file in, uh, in the wild. So it was weird. Uh, sometimes it is us, okay, we fix the bug, and we don't find any bug. We, we look at the code in FFmpeg, and actually, uh, the, um, the code in FFmpeg is not the uh, same as the um, standard, the, the draft, the, um, and in that case, oh, we find a bug in FFmpeg actually, and it happens everywhere. We, we have bugs uh, in Media Info, there are some bugs in FFmpeg too. 
So now, we, for FFV1, we are documenting the bugs um, and we put the bugs in the standard <coughs> for FFV, the current files in use. And after that, we will try to have a better standard and to have a new version of FFV1 without the bugs. But in that case, files are there, we describe the, the, the bugs in the standard and after we create a new version a good version, standardized version without any bugs. So uh, this is different uh, flows, but what we do when a standard exists, when only files exist, and so on. It is always difficult to to find the good path, but we try to have something not breaking what is already exists. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to open up the floor to any questions from the audience online or on site. And if there aren't any questions, I have a list of questions that I can get to as well. Go ahead. Hello, I'm uh, Ilona from the Netherlands. I work at Dance. We have a modest collection of audiovisual material consisting of oral history data. So there are interviews with survivors of World War, etc. And I hear a lot of interesting things <coughs> about MXF, Matroshka, and I adopted them as well to be one of our preferred formats, so to speak. Uh, we have the idea that hopefully in 10 years we can still open those files. However, the people who come to me and have done their interviews, they give me M4V, MP4, uh, AVI, everything really not good, I guess, uh, according to your standards. So my question is, what sh should I advise them? And maybe what should I advise dance? Um, there are different policies depending on who we speak, so it is my opinion, but it is not a common uh, opinion from everyone. So my opinion is um, you, ca uh, um, you cannot uh, get all the formats, so a lot of formats are proprietary solutions and you know that we you will lose uh, in the future the uh, description of, the f of such format. And for example, um, there are some formats with only one decoder and it is a proprietary decoder working only on Windows uh, 95 and uh, it does not work anymore on Windows 10, so bad. So in that case, you need to choose which format you can keep in your repository and the format you cannot keep in your repository. So if you have an MOV or MP4, it is a it is a standard. It is well used, and you have you have some documentation, so you you are sure you can play it back in the future because documentation exists. So instead of converting it to an, an, a more standard format, it may not worth it. But in the case uh, you have some proprietary format and uh, without any documentation without uh, an open source decoder, with, uh, without being sure you can play it back in 100 years, it is better to convert what you can today. And deciding about uh, what is not good, uh, what, what is proprietary and without any documentation and what is very open, there is a big thing uh, between and uh, the, the choice is not clear and we need to define maybe together what we need to convert and what we can keep as is. Mars? I'd like, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I want you to keep the original as well. Because with luck, there, there may be a better conversion in the future. Yeah, uh, true. This is also um, a policy choice because it is costly to keep the two versions, the one, the original one and the new one. But it is also uh, a possibility. So. You, you take the, the, um, the original one in order to be sure you keep everything you can and you, you, uh, you store also a playable version for sure with good for, uh, format. It is also, also in a policy. Um. Uh, yes, on the first, first row. Uh, one thing we learned in the Performer project that is an important lever for um, developers and open source developers to, to adopt a standard or a format is the, the, the availability of the existence of some sort of ground truth of what, how a file looks like. So it's not only the, the standard specification that should be precise and enough detailed, but there should be like 
what is really helpful for a developer is there is an elaborate or an extensive corpus of good and bad files uh, which developers can use to, to test their own and validate their own software. Can you talk a bit about approaches uh, of putting together such a test corpus in addition to writing or a very precise specification? And what is the relation between the specification and these test files? Yeah, there, there was a question sooner about how to validate validators, exactly. And uh, with Preforma, we worked a lot on having a corpus of files for testing any case uh, in our validator. So this is the way we validate our validator. And uh, yes, it is pretty important for us to, to have such files because the standards itself is not enough and we, ne we need to have some um, buggy files in order to be sure we detect every case we have. So uh, in that case, we check every uh, line in the specification and we try to create a valid file for that, also an invalid file for that, and we implement a conformance checker. So we work also uh, at the same time on the specification and uh, on the validator and also uh, a corpus of files which are buggy. So all together, we expect that we find a every case uh, and every bug in, in the specification with that. Do you follow up? It's easier. And a follow-up question. Isn't there a big risk that you're the only one who creates this file? Do you need oh. like more people creating these yeah. files? I also think about the ASO7 project where you also have one partner who creates his files. How do we deal we with this? We, we create the files when we have no uh, other files, but we take also files from archive.org. Uh, for us, it was very important to, to have external files. So we scanned uh, all the archive.org Matroska files. So Ashley, Dave, <laughs> they worked on that. <coughs> Uh, and uh, all we do is open, so it is on GitHub mostly, and we try to have some external um, commits so in order to not be alone about that. Because yes, uh, doing all alone with only the <coughs> same eyes on that is dangerous. We are we know that, but it, we we are looking for other pairs of eyes uh, on that. So for us, uh, the standard thing, the seller. Um, uh, in at IETF is important in order to have other eyes on that. And uh, there was a question also about uh, how to contribute. And you don't need to be an expert actually. You you just take a look on uh, the, specif the draft of specification and if you don't understand something, that means that our job is not good enough. So don't hesitate to ask because when you ask, it means that we need to improve something. So don't be shy about that. You, you don't understand something, say it. It is a mean for us who are always on in the specification so we know nearly everything and it is obvious for us. But it is maybe not obvious for you and we need to know that. So don't be afraid, come and ask. A uh, question in the back there. I just a... Uh, uh, a, a comment, uh, a comment on it. Lars, you made a very interesting point about readability or the lack of readability. But I think, uh, I think in, in, in many of the audiovisual standards, there's been a move towards complete and exact specifications, which I think you, you kind of need, and that tends to make them less and less readable. And also a quick comment about, a question about reference software implementations. To me, having a reference software implementation that is totally locked in with the standard and is used in the development of the standard uh, is very important because that, as a developer, you tend to, that's what you tend to test against and to, to, to develop against, whereas the, the, the specification is just text, you know. Um, it is sometimes, uh, I, IETF usually they want actually two uh, reference. Uh, they, when they uh, do the standard about uh, web browsing, they, they want that the feature is in, uh, in minimum two decoders, so they can test and see the compatibility. And uh, in my point of view, having a reference decoder is maybe not so 
good uh, because you can have bugs in the reference decoder and this policy of, of having two decoders is uh, better on my, uh, from my point of view. And this is the reason we have uh, FFmpeg decoder for FFv1, but I also implemented from the draft of uh, FFv1 specification my own decoder. So we, we have two uh, FFv1 decoder in that case, and none is actually the reference, but we have two implementations and we test the compatibility between uh, FFmpeg and MediaInfo decoder in that case. It is also a solution, no reference, but two implementations. Lars or Martin, did you want to comment on that? Uh, just, just about the language of standards, I mean, and, and how standards I is created, because, because that's twice a year a group of people meets in a room and they all have the same focus and, 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 and the focus of, uh, of uh, readability is not there I think uh, actually it wasn't and, and it's, it's a nice thing about the, the, the GitHub and, and the, the, uh, the huge community contributing to it like Jerome says if you don't understand it tell us and we'll rewrite it was never like that when, when I was working uh, with, with standards in the AES. It was just trying to be as precise as possible. And, and, and that is part of, 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 of uh, the sensible thing about the standard. It's going to be very, very precise, and which is something MXF is not. MXF is a compromise of so many different interests that when the actual implementations came out 10, 15 years ago, they were not compatible. MXFs created in one software wouldn't play in another software and things like that. So, well, thankfully, KubeTech has, has come up with a, a conformer that can take your, your um, MXFs and make them compatible with, with what's, what's out there now, but, but uh, but uh, no, standards are, are written for a specific community and not for people to understand, I think. Which is why recommended practices documents are, are a sensible thing to have. Can I ask Mark, my question to oh, Kate Murray? I, just because we only have um, time left for one more question, I want to give a chance for somebody who hasn't already asked something. Are there any other questions in the room? Sorry, do you mind if we take the, somebody else? Hello, I'm David Pflugo from Memoria. Uh, I don't know if this question is ideal for this panel, but uh, it's a real life experience. Um, I had a digitization job to do and I went to a service provider asking for a quote, asking for FFV1 and Matoshka. And they told me, uh, we don't do, deliver that format yet because it's not standardized yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to me, it's obvious it's kind of an excuse not to dig into the subject matter uh, for them. But, but anyway, how, uh, any suggestions? I mean, is it actually for a service pro provider a clever policy to, to act like that? Or any comments on, on that? <laughs> Funny. Um. <laughs> um. The, we are standardizing. Uh, we are doing the standard in order to n not hear about that anymore. <laughs> and but uh, currently, the standardization process is to documenting what I uh, is existing today. So, uh, from my point of view, uh, not supporting FFv1 today because it is not a standard. It is only not wanting to do that. That's all. This is getting an excuse for that. Uh, it is clear in IETF uh, um, when we document the standard that we don't break any files in the wild and we are working on that. So um, the draft is already good enough. Uh, we, we already have two decoders and one encoder. Uh, so it is there, it is available and um, 
for in my, in my opinion, this is only because they don't want to uh, to do uh, to do that. Uh, you are not important enough. Maybe I don't know. Um, they are too lazy. <laughs> and uh, the good thing with open source is when um, you a, a vendor does not want to to do the job for you, uh, uh, you can ask another developer to do that. And if you are locked with its vendor, so maybe you you need to change your vendor. I don't know. And Martin, I saw you nodding your head when Jerome was talking, um, and I know you also work as a developer as well, um, using these kind of uh, yeah. specifications and standards. Do you want to add that's something? Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think the, the problem is so many uh, many standards and uh, formats and um, <coughs> and the time. In ten years, nobody knows what is in ten years. Uh, Matroska is dead. <laughs> I hope not. And uh, yeah. I think uh, everybody has to find a way for himself or to uh, to get uh, the right codec and you need ever a decoder for presentation and uh, I think uh, for me that's why a problem for me too for many years I I have stored all my videos in the OGM format but OG, OG, OGM OGM but it's now not really uh, really exists anymore and you have transcode all the video and uh, the audio to the new f uh, container. So I think Matroska is the way we have to go because so many formats are implemented. You can store, you can store it so many uh, formats and uh, I'm really sure in the future there are more and uh, more better, better software to play back to presentation, the preservation, I hope. And uh, yeah, you should use Matroska. Lars, final word. So, yeah, it's a, it's just that I mean, why are we talking standards? Because if we, if we have the standard, nothing's going to die. We hope. Okay, so unfortunately, we're all out of time. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your qu great questions. Thank you so much to our panelists.